Hi everyone, I'm your host Mary Ben Rose and you're watching Healthy Living in the Bronx. And you're watching Healthy Living in the Bronx. And you're watching Healthy Living in the Bronx. Where we highlight people and organizations that are helping Bronx residents live a healthier life. Whether we are talking about organic beauty, demystifying fire cupping, and acupuncture, or learning the latest workout trends, the Bronx is inspiring and serving wellness communities locally and nationally. Without further ado, please welcome our host. Hi everyone, I'm your host, Mary Vin Rose, and you're watching Healthy Living in the Bronx, where we highlight people and organizations that are helping Bronx residents live a healthier life. Today we have a very special guest joining us in the studio, Wendy Lopez. Wendy is a registered dietitian and the co-founder of Food Heaven Made Easy. Without further ado, Wendy, welcome Hi. to the show. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm trying not to have this super <laughs> fangirl moment. Oh my God. Because I've been following you guys for like <laughs> at least like the past five years. So Aww. you and Jessica. And um, I just I just love how you guys are just helping us and helping women of color and changing that space of like nutrition and diet and just wellness. Um, so first question, how yeah. did you even become a registered dietitian? Great question. So I was working at a farmer's market here in the Bronx, actually. And at that point, I had already done my undergrad in psychology. And I, I wanted a career change, but I wasn't sure what to do. And at that point, my really good friend, Jess, she was already on the path to becoming a dietitian, a dietitian nutritionist. And so she was working at the farmer's market. And she was like, you should try it out. We do nutrition education. We teach people in the community how to eat more fruits and vegetables. And I was like, let me try it out for a summer. And it was great. It was, it was just so much fun. And it was just very inspiring to me to see how people would come back week after week with us showing them how to incorporate these fruits and vegetables into their plates. They were doing it and they were really excited about it. And they would come and tell us like, oh my God, I tried your recipe. I, you know, I made it this way. I made it that way. And so that was just like, that, that was, it was great for me. And so I was like, okay, I think I want to do this work. I think I want to work in the food space and the education space. And so I decided to do my master's in nutrition. And so through that whole process, Food Heaven was born, which is our brand. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the question that I have is how, like what's the difference between a nutritionist and a dietitian? Because yeah. I feel like I see the different names all the time, but I don't really know what they mean. Yeah, that's a great question because there's a lot of confusion. And so I think the easiest way to put it is a dietitian would be considered a nutritionist, but not, not the other way around. So a nutritionist wouldn't necessarily be considered a dietitian. So anyone would be able to call themselves a nutritionist because there's no regulation around the term. So you could be a nutritionist if you so wanted Mary to. So Mary Benro is a nutritionist. <laughs> yes, Got exactly. It. So you could be a nutritionist. But to be a dietitian, you have to go through very strict education guidelines, you have to do testing, you have to do continuing education credits, and it's all regulated mm -hmm. through the Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics. So, um, yeah, it, it's uh, it's just like, yeah, it's, complete, it's two completely different things, but not really. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> so the, so I, one of the things I love about you and Jess is that you're a big like advocate for plant-based meals. Mm -hmm. Recently, I heard like a podcast or an interview where someone was talking about like plant-forward meals. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? What exactly is plant-based? So plant-based to me means that your meals focus primarily on plants. So especially for people of color, we like to plan our meals around the meat, around mm -hmm. the protein, around the chicken, around the fish. And so with plant-based, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have that chicken there. It just means that the focus is going to be more so on plants. So on beans, on whole grains, on vegetables, mm -hmm. on root vegetables, that's really going to be the focus of the plate. And if we want to add in some animal protein, then that's fine too, but we want our plate to consist mostly of those plant-based foods because they have so many health-promoting properties. And they can help to reduce our risk for, um, for chronic conditions. And they also taste really good, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of people leave out. It's always like, oh, it's just healthy for you, it's healthy. But vegetables actually taste really great depending on how you make them, and so that's important to know too. So I know for me, so just give my viewers some like real-life experience, mm -hmm. I was that person. I was like, okay, I'm going to have salmon tonight. So what vegetable you know goes with the salmon but now I go okay so 
I'm feeling like I need a little bit of iron. So I'm gonna go with spinach and what's gonna complement my spinach? Mm -hmm. Which leads me to my next question. What is the difference between intuitive eating versus mindfulness eating? Is it a difference? Is it the same thing? What is it? Yeah, they're closely related, but there there are some differences. So with mindful eating, um, mindful eating basically means that you are fully present in the moment when you're eating. And so we know, especially now in the age of social media, it's like we're scrolling through our phone, we're on Instagram, we're watching Netflix while we're eating. And so with mindful eating, you're really savoring the moment. And when you're present and fully focused on the food that's in front of you, you're really able not only to enjoy it more, but also to tap into those hunger and fullness cues. Because a lot of times when we're distracted, we might miss that, hey, we're satisfied. We might want to stop eating. Or, hey, I didn't eat enough. And then later on, you're craving more food. So it's really about being in the moment. And with intuitive eating, it it's kind of mindful eating a step further, several steps forward. So with intuitive eating, there's different principles involved. And the premise is that you have all of that innate knowledge within you to know what the best choices are for you, for your health, for the foods that you're eating. And so with intuitive eating, you, you're you really kind of tapping in to the hunger and satiety as well, but also you have that body trust knowing what is best for your body, for your health, for what you need right now at that moment because it changes. And so especially now with diet, we live in a diet culture where it's like there's always new diets coming out and everyone's telling us what we should be eating. And intuitive eating says, no, you know what's best for you. You don't have to do a different diet every new year. Mm. You don't have to, you know, try this out and try that out because essentially you know what's best for you and you know what works for you and you have to really listen into that. So it's more internal versus external knowledge. Yeah, I think that's so... Because I've been doing that, I would say, the last two years, but I didn't know it had, like, a name. Mm -hmm. So what I do is that I actually base my food around that time of the month. As a woman, I know that when that time of the month comes, I tend to, like, need more magnesium, right? And I want something, like, that's sweet at the same time. So eating dark chocolate, I tend to load up on my dark chocolates. Um, it's also a time that I eat more calories, and that to me is intuitive eating. Would you say that's intuitive eating? It's definitely intuitive eating because your body is calling for it and your body needs that additional energy throughout that time of the month. So it's really like tapping into that. And also part of intuitive eating is honoring nutrition, honoring your health. Because I think a lot of times when people think about intuitive eating, they're like, oh, well, I can just eat cupcakes all day. <laughs> and it's not really about that because you, you, for most people, they would know that eating cupcakes all day, you're probably not going to feel so great because you're getting mm. all the sugar, your energy's going to fluctuate and so it's really about your body feeling good and what does that mean and part of that is honoring nutrition so eating balanced meals throughout the day because you want to be in good health and you respect your body mm. that actually like is something I tell one of my girlfriends and she goes oh you just eat so healthy I'm like do you think I want like when I first started do you think I really wanted to drink the green juice no but over time I started to remind myself that I'm worthy of the green juice. And then I found different ways to actually make it taste good. Because to your point, you've mentioned this before, eating well and healthy shouldn't taste bad. Exactly. Because there's people that just, they can't get down with the green juices. And that's mm -hmm. fine because you don't, you don't have to eat green juices. You can have, I think you mentioned that you had like eggs with greens earlier, right? Yes. For breakfast. <laughs> yes. So you could have like your greens cooked or you mm -hmm. could have your greens in a salad or in a soup. So you don't necessarily have to blend them. I think smoothies are just like a really nice, convenient way to have a meal on the run, but they're not for everyone. So it's like, you don't have to drink a green smoothie to be healthy. There's so many other options. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time because I never ate raw spinach in my house. Yeah. So eating raw spinach was just a no-go. So I just kept at it and I just kept finding different ways to eat it. And I realized like the dressing that I use when I made, now I have like my own like signature, like red Ooh. chili pepper, red chili pepper <laughs> lime dressing. That's like my signature. I love it. Um, I love it because I know what's in the salad dressing and there's no preservatives. I make it like the night before and like yeah. I let it last through the week. Um, so I just want to like continue the conversation about how what we eat is important, but it doesn't have to be bad for you. So speaking of something that's bad for you. So I recently <laughs> saw this article, right? This broke my heart because ah. I'm, like, I've spoken about this on the show. My okay. Anyone that watches Healthy Living in the Bronx, I talk about this pr product all the time 
coconut oil. Mm, okay. <laughs> so coconut oil, I read an article that coconut oil is actually bad for you. Please tell okay. me that's not true. What, like, what is the deal with coconut oil? So coconut oil, along with other foods, I think the issue really is that people count on one thing to be the cure-all. So this happens just like it happened with coconut oil. It's happened with many other foods. People are like, oh my God, they go crazy. And there's like a craze for a certain amount of time and then some science comes out and then it's like, oh, wait a minute, like what's going on with this product? So with coconut oil specifically, um, so coconut oil is very high in saturated fat. And so I think that maybe the article was touching on that. Because yeah, I think it was like from like the Go Red campaign or something like that. Are, so the American Heart Association recently, they mm -hmm. put out a statement in which they reviewed all of the research and uh, they concluded that the saturated fat in coconut oil negatively impacts LDL cholesterol, which is known as the cholesterol that isn't so great for your heart. And so the thing is that with the coconut oil craze that happened not too long ago, I feel like it's fairly recent where everyone mm -hmm. was like just going crazy over coconut mm -hmm. oil and putting it in their smoothies and their, and yeah, their, that, and their coffee yeah. and like mm -hmm. all, all these things that I was hearing. And I'm like, why are people like putting <laughs> coconut oil in their coffee? Um, <laughs> but it's like, you know, people get really excited and they want fast results and they want these cure-all foods. And coconut oil, there's nothing wrong with it mm -hmm. when you use it in moderation. But when you see it as like the cure-all and you start using it excessively, that's when it might become a problem. So one tablespoon of coconut oil meets most of your daily needs for saturated fat. So it, it's, it's, you know, it has a significant amount of saturated fat. And I think that it was positioned as like a superfood because it also has a high amount of MCT, which is medium chain triglycerides, which have been known to have some health promoting properties. But the issue is that when you have it in excess, just like with anything, with any oil, really, if you're having like, you know, cups of olive oil, for example, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be great for your health either. It's, it's very fat. It's 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 very high in fat and so you, you want to be careful with portions as well so I cook with coconut oil I love coconut oil I use it on my skin and my hair but I'm not like just pouring it in my smoothie just because it's like coconut oil and it's the best thing ever if that makes sense mm, that's very true now I mentioned this earlier in the show I'm such a fan girl so I listen to the podcast um, you guys have a podcast uh -huh. you have a blog yeah. you have a book I love the book and um, so I wanted to know, I, I think I was listening to the podcast one day and you was talking a lot about pre-diabetes mm -hmm. versus like diabetes and like the yeah. way that food can impact it, like prevention mm -hmm. or treating. So can you tell me a little bit more about what's the difference between pre-diabetes and diabetes? Sure. So pre-diabetes is when your blood sugar is elevated, but it's not elevated to the point of being considered diabetes. So there would be the normal range, the pre-diabetes range, and then the diabetes range. So the good thing about pre-diabetes is that you're still in that space where you can make some changes and potentially get back to the normal range, or you could slow the progression of diabetes. Because the thing with diabetes is that a lot of times people come into the doctor and they haven't gotten checked in years, and then they have full-blown uncontrolled diabetes. And so with pre-diabetes, you still have that chance to maybe make some changes and see if that'll help to improve your blood sugar. Mm. Yeah. So how does someone, all right, not to put myself on the spot or my mm -hmm. family on the spot, but something that I struggle with, my family has a long history of diabetes. Okay. And the constant conversation I have with my mom is, sorry, mom, I know you watch the show. Ah, Love you. Hey, but, mom. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it's true. Um, like I, when I bring it up to her, like diet is so important for mm -hmm. us. She was like, baby, my mama been eating like this and my mama's been eating like yeah. this. And I'm trying to convince her that it's not just in our DNA. Like there's ways that we can affect our, our health right now and for future generations. Right. And plus the food we're eating now is not what great grandma ate. Mm -hmm. The food here is actually very different. Yeah. So how do you go about dealing with those type of clients or those type of just people who are just like so resistant? They don't think food really has an impact. It's just something that happens to them. Yeah, well with diabetes, there's a lot of, they're called modifiable risk factors. So there are things that you can do to change, to lower your risk for diabetes, like lifestyle things, like stress, like exercise, like all of these lifestyle factors can help to lower your risk. And so it's hard, you know, especially with older folks who are very resistant to change, but I think approaching it from a place of 
not restriction, but mm -hmm. addition. So instead of saying you can't eat this, 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 talking about, hey, what can we add to the plate to make it a little healthier? What mm -hmm. foods do you enjoy eating? How can we remix this up a little bit to make it to make it healthier, but to still, you know, to still stay true to the to the foods that you enjoy? So I usually approach it that way. And nine times out of ten, people are very open, you mm -hmm. know, to to hearing about suggestions or just learning about ways to be a little healthier, but I think when you approach it with like scare tactics or telling people like, this is what you need to get, or this is what you need to eat or else you're gonna get diabetes. That's, that's mm -hmm. just not a healthy way or a compassionate way to talk to people about their health. Right, yeah. so is there a meal that you recommend or something that you recommend for people who maybe have pre-diabetes or actually have diabetes? So the great thing is that for people with pre-diabetes and diabetes, the recommendations that I give are pretty much in line for a general healthy plate. So there isn't like a special diabetes plate. I know that a lot of people think, oh, you have diabetes or pre-diabetes, you really need to cut down on the carbs, but actually, just general healthy plate is, is mostly plant-based. It's mostly vegetables. So I like to follow the MyPlate method. I think it's like just the easiest way to understand how to balance a plate. And it's half of the plate, non-starchy vegetables, a fourth carbohydrate, whether that's your beans, your whole grains, your platanos, like whatever, and then a fourth plate, protein. And that's a completely balanced plate for someone with diabetes or without diabetes. And it helps with blood sugar control. So no, like, get, like, skinny tricks or themes or things like that like I've been reading a lot no. about like um <laughs> I've been reading a lot about like celery juice like celery juice has been you know what I'm talking about that's yeah, why the eyes I don't, are I don't know how people are gulping this stuff down I think <laughs> celery is disgusting <laughs> as a juice really <laughs> I do so, yeah but people are telling me like if you have diabetes or you're pre-diabetic drink all this like celery juice it's so alkalining and it does like all these amazing yeah. things well similar right I don't think that the um that the celery juice will have a similar effect to the coconut oil because because it doesn't have all the saturated fat, but it's the same, it's kind of the same idea where people stick with one thing. I remember at one point it was like Moringa. I don't know if you remember that. There was mm -hmm. a Moringa craze, yes. All over Latin America, it was like Moringa, it cures cancer. Like people <laughs> really? kind of wow. go with these juices or these, you know, these foods, specific foods, mm. specific whatever, and they run with it. And so it's really about looking at the bigger picture and not focusing on one thing. Because if you're having celery juice, but you don't have a real understanding of how to balance your plate. It's like, you know, how, what benefit is that celery juice really having? If you're still having an unbalanced plate, you don't really understand the concept of wellness as a whole with stress, with sleep, mm -hmm. with exercise, you know, like where is that celery juice coming in? How is it helping? That's true. It seems that we need to have like a really good balance um, on our plate. And I think to have something, um, for my viewers to really go home with. So what was the, what was the name of the the, the the process, my plate? The my plate method, yes. It's like the easiest way to plan a plate and it's very visual. If you look it up, my plate, they have, uh, they have different plates for like different cultures too. Like mm -hmm. they have an African-American plate, they have a Latino plate. Really, so and where do they find this information at? So my plate, I believe it was started by Michelle Obama. Really? Yeah, because before it was the pyramid, which mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember, it was not very practical <laughs> for people mm -hmm. who were trying to put together a healthy plate. And so she launched this whole my plate and it was really like a visual representation of what balance looks like on a plate. And and it's been great. I use it with my patients and they love it. They get it instantly. So can you go like to like myplate.org? Or yeah, it? it's it's on the it's on the USDA website. Oh nice. And they uh, a lot of websites use it. The uh, American Diabetes Association uses it. A lot of government organizations use it for education. Definitely going to have to check this out. Yeah. So I'm actually getting the cue that we have to take a quick break. Okay. But to my viewers at home, I want to make sure that you stay tuned in. Because when we get back from break, Wendy's going to tell us more about intuitive eating and what it's like to be a girl boss of a wellness empire. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. This is the moment I knew. His future had no boundaries. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Mary Van Rose, and you're watching Healthy Living in the Bronx. Before the break, we were actually talking to Wendy Lopez, a registered dietitian all about intuitive eating and her wellness empire, Food Heaven Made Easy. <laughs> oh my gosh. So the conversation was getting so good. We learned a lot about like my plate, which is actually something that was started by Michelle Obama. 
and a way for us to be more plant-based or plant-forward is the new term. Mm -hmm. I think I think I'm trending <laughs> with that, right? Like if I'm not, you guys can definitely send me a, a text message or a DM rather at Instagram. You can follow us at Healthy Living in the Bronx on Instagram. But anyways, um, I wanted to know what is it like being like this wellness entrepreneur that you are? Like how did healthy Healthy living in the Bronx. How did <laughs> how did Food Heaven Made Easy come about? Well, Food Heaven Made Easy, we started at the farmers market. So how I was talking about before, me and Jess were working at mm -hmm. the farmers market. We the farmers market here in the Bronx it ends when the winter time comes, and we were just like so psyched about all the education that we were providing in the community. We were like, oh well, how can we keep this going? And when the season ends, and so we were like, oh, let's record some videos and, you know, in our apartment, we'll do cooking nutrition videos and we'll put them out on the local channel. So that's how we started. Um, we were just like filming videos in Jessica's Brooklyn apartment. We put them on the on the local Brooklyn channel. And then a friend was like, why don't you guys put it on YouTube? And we we're like, OK, we didn't even know YouTube was a thing back then. This was like maybe eight years ago. Yeah, that's like that was like the a long time the ago. Curve. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so we started putting it out and organically, like things just really started growing and we started getting an audience and they, and we kind of just went with what people were asking us for. So they were like, oh, we would love to see your recipes like organized on the website. So we were like, let's build a website and just have all the recipes and videos on there. And so throughout, throughout the years, things just kind of evolved where we started a podcast because Jessica moved to California and we wanted to find a way to keep in touch and still provide that education. We have a cookbook. We do a lot of content development. We do a lot of partnerships. And so throughout the years, it's really turned into a business, but it started out as a passion project. And we had no idea that it was going to be something that was going to turn into a full-time career for us. Mm. How yeah. did you know? Like, when was that moment that you were like, I think we have something very special? And then what was the moment that, because I know it's a series, but like, mm -hmm. do you remember like a moment where you were like, no, I need to do this full-time? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, that moment for me happened, I would say, a couple of years ago, actually, fairly recently, where I was just burned out. I was mm. doing too much. I was doing full-time work, and then Food Heaven is full-time work as well. Essentially, I was working two full-time jobs, and I was just trying to juggle having a personal life, too, and we're preaching all of this, like, wellness and health, and here I was not really incorporating that into my personal life. I wasn't resting. I was overworked. And so I knew that I had to make some kind of transition mm -hmm. to focus on food heaven because it's it's been something that I've constantly been motivated by throughout the years, mm -hmm. you know, with, with jobs. I've had amazing opportunities with all the jobs that I've had, but... Eventually, I've gotten burned out. And with Food Heaven, I've never felt like it's always been something that, that I want to keep doing, that I want to keep going with. So, yeah, I, I've stuck with it. And now it's I'm pretty much doing it full time. But it, it's been a process getting there. I think that's like I learned from a blogger that came on our show mm. that working on a blog takes her on average about 25 hours a week. Oh, it's a lot of work because it's not just working on a blog. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have to develop content for us, we're doing recipe development, we're shooting, we're doing photography, we're doing conferences, we're doing speaking engagements, we're doing the pod. I mean, it's a lot of work, you know. The blog is just like a very small part of it. So basically, like for you, like you said, it was two full-time jobs. It was a lot. It was too much, and I wasn't taking care of myself. And so, yeah, I made the decision to just focus on the business, and it's been going great. So yeah. what made you do this with your BFF? Like, I love, yeah, I love the story, <laughs> but, like, some people don't work well together. Let's be honest. I know. It's a hit or miss. For us, it's definitely been a hit, <laughs> but <laughs> it's a hit or miss. I mean, we, we kind of just went with it. We mm -hmm. became best friends throughout the process. When we first started, we were kind of still getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I was just like, yeah, let's be friends. You're cool. And we, and we kind of just got to know each other throughout the years. We work really well together. We know each other's strengths, you know, and we know areas that we need to work on. So we complement each other really well and it's worked for us. But I, I've seen it the other way where friends get together to try to do a business venture and it and it goes really left really quick. So <laughs> thankfully for us, it's been great. So what advice do you have for anyone who's thinking about going into business with their best friend? 
I would say be very clear from the beginning about what the roles and responsibilities mm. are. Wait, say that again. I need people went back to get this. <laughs> what, like, I think people really need to understand that because I've learned that from my own experience. Yeah. So say yeah. it again. What is it? Just being very clear about the responsibilities and roles because, yeah, I think things can get a little murky <laughs> when mm. responsibilities start changing perhaps. And, you know, maybe there's times where someone needs to take on more work, someone, you know, and it's just always evolving so you really want to try to go into business with someone who you trust mm -hmm. and who's also flexible with you because things change and um you want to yeah you want to know and trust that that person is putting their best foot forward and they're as invested as you are in the business how do you find how do you find balance um as a wellness professional like my number one question on the show when i'm talking to wellness professionals is we tend to take care of everybody when you're yeah. in this space of service, right? How do you find balance or how do you take care of yourself? Yeah. Well, I'm definitely that wellness person who put self-care like at the very top of the priority list like I, I like that Yay. yeah I'm not that person who's getting two hours of sleep preaching wellness like I sleep every night eight hours <laughs> okay girl I'm lucky if I get like girl I have a sleep to get tracker no 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 I don't play with that because for me I just instantly feel it you know if mm -hmm. I'm not rested if I'm overwhelmed if I'm not doing things that are restorative I feel it. I, you know, I, I'm not as cheery. I'm not as um, efficient with my work. I'm not doing it as well. And, um, and so I do a number of things to make sure that I'm taking care of myself. I spend a lot of time by myself, but then I know when it's time to also spend time with my partner, with my loved ones, with my family, um, because that's kind of at the top of my priority list, my relationship. So making sure that I make time for that, make sure that I'm making time to stay active because that makes me feel good too, that I, I'm making time to cook since that's what I'm preaching. Like all these things, you know, things that I enjoy doing, making time for Netflix, you know, just making time for all of those little things so that, so that I feel happy and I feel okay. And, and I may be happy all the time, but at least I feel like I have some kind of peace of mind. You know, so I, I just make it a priority. And at the end of the day, what doesn't get done doesn't get done. I don't try to cram in a million things like everything is not going to get done. And I feel like the more you get into this work, the more opportunities come. And so you have to learn to say no to certain things and and just kind of be selective about what you are saying yes to. Wendy, thank you so much for all that you're thank doing. Thank you for having me. This has been great. Like, it was so crazy. Like, I forgot what interview it was, but I was like, oh, I just love these girls. And then I saw that you were from the Bronx. Yes! Like, oh, my God. Oh, my God, yes! I was That's like, we right. have to. <laughs> like we have to get Wendy on the show. Like Absolutely. she has to she has to speak with us and to our audience. Um, again, thank you for being here. Oh my god, big up to you guys for doing this amazing show that is so needed in the Bronx. Like it was just so refreshing when you reached out to me and I'm like, oh my god, they're they're doing this? Like this oh is great. God. We need more of this. Like I'm like I'm like trying not to get like choked up. <laughs> like like try hold it together. Hold no, it together. No, you're Mary. doing really important oh. work and this is this is amazing. So I can't wait to see all the great things that you're going to be doing with the show. Yes, thank you so much. And um, I want to give a special thank you to my viewers for tuning in as always and I hope to see you on the next episode of Healthy Living in the Bronx. Bye guys.